You're listening to the Broadway Podcast Network. Why? Why? If you Why? have T-Mobile 5G home internet, you might be hearing this Why? a lot. Why? Every time your internet slows down during the busiest hours. Why? Why? Because your network gives priority to cell phone users. Why? Why? Good question. Why not switch to Cox Internet with two times faster download speeds than T-Mobile 5G home internet during peak hours? Okay. Stop the whys and visit cox.com slash 5G home for details. T-Mobile prioritizes certain T-Mobile phone users over home internet users during times of congestion. In the spirit of reconciliation, the Theatre Thoughts podcast acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respects to their elders past and present and extend that respect to all traditional custodians of the land on which our episodes are recorded. Uh, The wonderful and amazing Hans Zimmer wrote the um, the score, um, that is the, the music, that wasn't songs or derived from the songs. So we had a, a fantastic time working together. I mean, Hans is obviously amazing. Mm. And um, yeah, it's always uh, surprised me how popular the animated feature was with kids. Yeah. You know, it seemed kind of adult to me, but I meet people all the time who tell me that it was their favorite animated feature growing up. You're listening to the Theatre Thoughts Podcast, your backstage pass to the world of theatre in Australia and beyond. I'm Justin, your guide through the drama, comedy and pure magic of the stage from the heart of Australia to the grandest stages worldwide. Join us here for enlightening conversations, reviews and behind-the-scenes stories from the artists themselves. Subscribe for your regular dose of theatre inspiration and consider supporting us on Patreon for exclusive content. Follow us on Instagram at theatrethoughtsaus and ttpod underscore official and discover even more over on our TikTok, Theatre Thoughts Australia. So join us as we rise the curtain on a brand new episode of the Theatre Thoughts Podcast. Welcome, everyone, to an extremely special episode of the Theatre Thoughts Podcast. I have with me a man who needs no introduction, but I'm going to do one anyway. He studied piano and composition at the Juilliard School of Music and while in high school and graduated from the Carnegie Mellon University in 1968 with a BFA in drama. In 1971, he wrote the music and lyrics for Godspell, for which he won two Grammys, among other awards. He's collaborated with Alan Menken on Pocahontas, The Hunchback of Notre Dame, and Enchanted, as well as writing the music for Prince of Egypt, and not to mention he's the writer of Wicked, which is currently playing in Australia. Stephen Schwartz, thank you so, so much for joining us on the podcast. Uh, Good morning, Justin. Happy to be here, and hello, Australia. (laughs) This is is a pinch-me moment. When I got the email like through, I was just like, I'm sorry, sorry, what? And I had to do a double take. I was like, yes, I'd very much love to talk to Stephen Schwartz. Thank you very much. Uh, Well, happy to talk to you. And, you know, we're talking about this um, video capture of the production of Prince of Egypt that was in the West End for about a year. And it's, uh, you know, I'm a a fan of the production. Let's Mm. put it that way. Yes, I thought it was a beautiful production. So I'm excited that it's been captured on video and gotten out to into the world and happy to support it. And of course, you worked on the film um, with Hans Zimmer, um, you know, so you've got a long history with it. And it was really weird because I I got the link and I watched um, the production and I felt like, to be honest, I felt like a kid again because I haven't seen it since I was a young boy. And like I knew you know, the whole story of Moses and Exodus and everything. And the music of the Prince of Egypt, the film, was one of those ones that was just so elevated for a DreamWorks animated film. And it stuck with you. And so when I was watching the recording and I was listening to, you know, Deliver Us and all the other songs in there, I was just transported back to watching it as a child. And um, it, you're right. It's an amazing production. I was gobsmacked. Thank you. Yeah, for for those of your uh, listeners who don't know, um, I wrote the songs for the original DreamX, uh, DreamWorks animated feature, which was in the late, I think it came out in 1999 or something like that. Mm. <clears throat> Excuse me, it's early here in New York, so <laughs> I'm drinking my tea and clearing my throat. Um, uh, the wonderful and amazing Hans Zimmer 
wrote the um the score um that is the the music that wasn't songs or derived from the songs so we had a, a fantastic time working together i mean Hans is obviously amazing mm. and um yeah it's always uh surprised me how popular the animated feature was with kids yeah. you know it seemed kind of adult to me but I meet people all the time who tell me that it was their favorite animated feature growing up mm -hmm. um and I've asked, consequently I've asked why because yeah. you know I would expect it to be something more cartoony but um from what I'm told kids like the, sort of the reality of it that it deals with um big issues and doesn't shy away from dark um you know d the dark part of life um and also I think they respond to the character of Moses trying to find himself and what is his purpose in the world yeah. um but yeah I mean uh, uh, you know I, I, that pleases me obviously a lot and then um you, I was very um happy as I as I told you with the uh, the production of the stage show, which obviously has many more songs in it than the movie because it can be, it's a stage show, so it can be longer and also gets into, I think, in a more um, complex way, the relationship between the two brothers of Moses and Ramses. Yeah, I was going to say, yeah, the, it really delves into it a lot more and you really feel for Ramses more than I, I think he would in the in the film because you know he's given this role of being the pharaoh he has to live up to his father just as Moses needs to find who he is so and I think this is like what you do well with Wicked as well you create really beautiful relationship dynamics between your main protagonists and especially in their musics and their and their big ballad numbers that really complement each other which I think carries on with Prince of Egypt as well. Thank you yeah I mean that's What's interesting to me is, uh, um, you know, when I was a, a, a kid, my favorite musical was Rodgers and Hammerstein's The King and I, though obviously, right. even though I'm older, I wasn't old enough to see the original production, but I, you know, saw revivals. And what I loved about that show was the relationship between the King of Siam and Anna, and that one wasn't a hero and one wasn't a villain. And they were, it was a complicated relationship that was ultimately based on love, um, but wasn't, wasn't simple, you know, good guy, bad guy. Obviously that's what Wicked is about. And we tried to bring that approach to, um, you know, to Prince of Egypt as well. You know, no one is a villain to himself. Mm -hmm. You know, everybody, no matter how villainous we may think they are, has his or her own reasons for for doing, you know, what they're doing. Um, and we really we really did not want to make it the story of my God's better than your God. Yeah. You know, we really wanted to make it the story of these two brothers who love each other, but are trapped by their own destinies and their own responsibilities. And it causes them to have to um, be antagonists to one another. Exactly. Well, um, I'd love to, I'll put a pin in Prince of Egypt for now, because I'd love okay. to delve into the man behind the music uh, okay. for a second. I'd love to ask you um, our one minute theatre thoughts questions and see uh -oh. what comes off the top of your head. I'm just saying up front, these things make me very nervous because I know, I, you know, I always have find the answers 10 minutes later. I'm like, oh, I should have yes. said so yeah. just with that as a preamble, I will do my best. <laughs> Excellent. All right. Well, let's have a look. So the first question is, um, what has been your favorite production you've seen recently? Uh, well, I'm New York based, so I'm going to talk about um, Broadway shows, mm. uh, which may not yet have gotten to Australia. Um, there was a, a wonderful musical um, that opened last year called Kimberly Akimbo um, yes. that actually won the the Tony Award, et cetera. Um, and I, it's, it's a really beautiful and quirky and quite touching show with great performances. And Janine Tesori uh, wrote the music and I, I'm a big fan of hers. So, um, you know, I, I really, uh, I really did love that. And uh, yeah, I think, I think in terms of musicals, uh, that's been my favorite recent uh, show that I've seen. Beautiful. Great answer. Okay. Um, name a production that's left you speechless. doesn't have to be recent. could just be at any moment. Oh, gosh, there are a lot of them. Yeah. I, I mean, off the top of my head, 
I would say two of them, one of them, which is recent and is not a musical, but um, the production of Harry Potter and the Cursed Child. I don't know. Yes. There. Yeah, uh, I saw I, that this year, actually. Yeah, I actually saw it. I've seen it three times and I saw the full length one where you went yeah. out to dinner between the part one and part two. And I thought that that is one of the best productions in terms of the staging and the design uh that it was jaw dropping to me it's it's so good and then going way back i i guess i would cite the original production of a chorus line right. because i'd never seen anything like it and the 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 first of all the use of dance but also um the the sort of reality of it was very influential on me. Uh, some years later, I did the show Working, and that was obviously very influenced by a chorus line. And um, yeah, just how much Michael Bennett and his team achieved with such simple elements, uh, I thought was really dazzling as a production. Beautiful. I love that. Um, uh, oh, it might be a bit of a tough one, this one, but uh, oh. I'd love to know, what's the most rewarding show you've worked on? Oh, that's, that's an interesting question. Um, people always ask me my favorites, and I oh, okay. and I, I decline to answer those because yeah. <laughs> uh, I think that's a different question, and I don't like to get myself in between um, the audience and the and the work. But exactly. I think over time, the most rewarding show for me has been Children of Eden. Okay. Uh, it's a very, very meaningful show to me in terms of its themes. And the fact that it took a while for my co-writer, John Carrot and myself to get the show right. We had a London tryout that didn't work initially. Um, and then we went back and, and worked on the show over time. And, you know, now it's become sort of this staple of musical theater, but it, um, I think it was, it's been, it was very rewarding to me to, for want of a better word, solve that show and and make it work because I am very proud of my score for it. And I feel the themes are extremely relevant to, you know, what we're dealing with in our world. I love that. That's great. I love, I love that you've gone. Yeah. The rewarding, the challenges that you face and that's mm -hmm. like rewarding and so great. Um, okay. Last one is, uh, do you have, or what is your all time favorite musical? Well, I already talked about King and I. Yes. Um, and that that remains my all time favorite musical. You know, I talked about how the characters are portrayed, but also the score by Richard Rogers, um, obviously Oscar Hammerstein's lyrics, mm -hmm. but particularly the music for King and I and how Rogers was able both to evoke a place like um, what was then, you know, obviously it's Thailand now, but was then Siam and still sound like Richard Rogers. I mean, this is a, there's a direct line from the score for King and I to the score for Prince of Egypt, where I, my attempt was to achieve the exact same thing that Rogers did to evoke the feeling of ancient Egypt and the Israeli tribes, the Hebrew tribes, but also sound like myself at the same time. ¿Te preocupas por tu familia? Entonces, ¿por qué darle solo huevos ordinarios cuando pueden disfrutar de lo mejor? Egglands Best, los únicos huevos con ese delicioso sabor fresco de granja, además de la mejor nutrición, como 6 veces más vitamina D, 10 veces más vitamina E y 25% menos de grasa saturada que los huevos regulares, además de muchos otros nutrientes importantes. Así que, dales los mejores huevos. Egglands Best, mejor sabor, mejor nutrición, mejores huevos. Excellent. Well, actually, that's a great segue because I was going to actually talk about the music now for um, for Prince of Egypt. Well, thank you, first of all, for doing our theater thoughts questions. I love that so sure. much. Um, but the what you just said about um, replicating and kind of being inspired by that music. When I was listening to Prince of Egypt in terms of the you know the big musical version, I was listening to it and what you said about capturing Egypt and the vastness of it. It was reminiscent to me of some of the music that was in Miss Saigon in terms of the vastness of the situation mm -hmm. that the characters yeah. found themselves in, especially with Deliver Us as this big, powerful opening number. And I was just like, it's, yeah, it's like, I, I just had flashes of Miss Saigon because I was like, big, beautiful, punchy vastness of the entire space. And I'd love to know, like, when you were working on this music, what was the influences for you 
to get all these other songs. Because obviously you worked on it way back in 1998, 1999, but adapting it to the stage would have been a very different task altogether. It, it was, but I returned to the same sources that I used, to, you know, obviously my research from the, uh, when I was doing the film, uh, I didn't throw it away. <laughs> so mm-hmm. I still had it. And, you know, I had recordings of ancient Egyptian court music, how anyone knows what it was, I don't know. Yeah, right. But apparently someone did some research and recorded what they could find. Um, I have recordings of, you know, Hebrew um, lullabies and music from that period. I, I mean, that, that that part of the world. And also, frankly, sort of pop, um, some some sort of pop records that I got when I was on my trip to Egypt and kind of bought on the streets of Cairo, oh, wow. um, you know, just, just to try and get that flavor. Yeah. And for the, you know, obviously with a movie, you, you can have a 90 piece orchestra. So you're not able to do that in a show, but we wanted to get the epic quality mm. that the score for the movie had, um, Justin, that you were just talking about. Um, and the orchestrator, uh, August Eric Smullen, is a guy who's extremely good with um, bringing authentic kind of ethnic instruments. And he did the um, orchestrations, for instance, for Come From Away, where oh, he right. got a northern Canadian. So he's very good at interpolating authentic instrumentation into his score. And um, and so he in, he did that as well with the orchestrations for Prince of Egypt. So there are a lot of authentic Middle Eastern I- instruments, particularly percussion instruments, mm. but some wind instruments as well that are used as part of the orchestra. Actually, I have some notes here. So because uh, I was going to mention that. So you've got um, include and I'm going to get these names wrong and I'm going to be so embarrassed. A bazooki, a duembek and an oud. Um, that's right so, yeah so you have those you got them all right by the way all was it good those, yeah all three of those are pronounced correct <laughs> excellent <laughs> thank you um yeah and and so those influences really came through especially in the numbers like when moses goes to the desert and those influences Great. start to like come into it and you can hear it which i love um but i'd love to give just a, i want to read through some of these because when i was watching it i didn't quite like i took in how vast the production was but when you read some of these facts i was like this is a big production. Yeah, it's um, very big. So it's a, a company of almost 60 artists. It includes right. fire effects, illusions, pyrotechnics, performers flying. You've got projections. More than 50 makers, milliners, and sewers were involved in producing over a 1,000 individual costumes, headdresses, jewelry, pairs of shoes, and wigs. It is a big production. And yeah. I think yeah. it's the only way you can tell this story as well. Yeah, it's a big story about big events and people dealing with huge emotions. Um, You know, we were in a big theater, you know, we were in the the Dominion Theater in London, which is vast. And we had to we had to fill that theater. And I I just think the design that I, I think I hope it comes across in the in the video capture of it. You know, it's it's hard because I know what it looked like on stage. Yeah. And it was kind of jaw-droppingly beautiful. Yeah. Um, I think you can see it because there are a lot of, you know, long shots of camera and you get a, you get a feeling for what it looked like on stage. But it, it was pretty amazing to see because it, it went out into the house and kind of enveloped the audience as well. So, uh, yeah. That's beautiful. And I think you can tell, you can tell especially by the sheer number of the ensemble that are in it and body work that goes into it I thought was so so clever because you could have done projections you could have done you know sets but the the ensemble themselves make like the burning bush they make the trolleys that the slaves pull the bricks on it's very clever and um I think it adds some themes to it as well in terms of yeah I I agree yeah yeah Sean Cheeseman did the amazing choreography uh Scott Schwartz is the director and together they came up with this concept that since there were laborers who were doing all this work, you shouldn't use like machinery that just, you know, or as you say, projections, but, you know, the the use of dancers' bodies should create the Nile Mm. and the 
sands of of Egypt and the, you know the stones of the desert as you say the burning bush this is all created with dancers and yeah I I, I had never quite seen anything like it I, I thought it was pretty amazing yeah definitely well I'd love to jump back a bit and I'd love to ask the tale of how it came about how did you know this land on your desk and said we'd love to do the stage adaptation well, for years, I and uh, I personally, but also DreamWorks, the company, kept getting requests for um, to to be able to do a stage version of the show, and there were sort of groups doing it illegally. Oh, um, right. <laughs> when when I was in Denmark working on something. Um, the uh, book writer for Prince of Egypt, Philip Lezevnik, who lives in Denmark, said, I hear this, they're doing a stage version of Prince of Egypt over in Sweden. Should we go over and take a look at it? And, you know, we did, and they, they you know, just were making up their own version. And so, you know, we got in touch with DreamWorks and we said, well, we should probably do something about this so that if people want to do the show, there's actually a real show for them to do. And meanwhile, DreamWorks had been considering doing, putting together a, a stage version, just as I say, because they're getting so many requests. What's so great now is that um, the MTI, the, the licensing company, mm. is putting together the show um, so that it can be licensed. If you want to do it in your school, if you want to do it in your you know, home theater or whatever, very very soon you'll be able to and now there's both the 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 cast recording of the songs but also now this video recording to help people get an idea of oh these are some things you could do i mean obviously in a school they're not going to do a production the size yeah. of <laughs> the stage on the video tough, but, yeah. <laughs> but they can be inspired by by mm. that make their own choices. So, you know, I'm excited that along with this video being put out there, um, the ability to license the show is is also being uh, made possible. Yeah, definitely. Um, a question I'd love to ask, I know we're heading towards the end of our time, um, but I'd okay. love to ask you a question I ask um, everyone on the podcast because everyone always well, gets no, different uh, it's not. It's not like an off the top of your head one. <laughs> okay, I get intimidated by these things. Yeah. Um, I'll ask him. We'll see how we go. So okay. I'd, I'd love to know how you think the theatre industry has changed over the years and how those changes have impacted the work that you do and the work that you create. Okay. I mean, uh, I think I think it's changed in some positive ways, but also some, some not good ways. Um, just to be brutally honest, at least, again, I work in, in New York, principally mm -hmm. in the Broadway theater, but also, you know, see what goes on in the West End of London. And it, it I understand the reasons for this, but I feel there's a, an awful lot of playing safe. Right. There's an awful, awful lot of, oh, we can only do something pre-sold. Um, now, admittedly, we're talking about Prince of Egypt, which was a title that people wanted to see. So in a way, this falls into that category, mm. although we tried to do some dangerous things <laughs> during the production, you know, so it, it wasn't, a, 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 you know, simply pick it up from the animated feature and put it down. Yeah. Um, but I, I try not to let that um, philosophy impact what I do. I try to keep dealing with subject matter um that's unusual and maybe you wouldn't expect it um but it but it delves into things that are you know it's not just a jukebox musical in, a, in other words um not to put those down some of them are excellent some of them not so excellent but <laughs> you know there are some good one good jukebox musicals yeah i still respond to i, I mentioned kimberly akimbo to you mm. before just a, an interesting, weird play um, and that got converted into an interesting, weird musical with a very original score. And, and that's still what I respond to the most. That's great. That's so good. Yeah, I, I, I find it because I was really interested to ask that question because obviously you've had, you know, such a career working with so many people in so many different facets of, you know, the entertainment world. So yeah, so I was when I was thinking about that question, I was like, "What, what is he going to say? Like, how can how can I ask him this question?" Um, so yeah, thank you so much for that. I think it's very enlightening yeah. to see um, to see your thoughts on it. Thanks.
Excellent. Um, well, I know we're at the end, uh, end of our time, um, so I'll, I'll I'll wrap up the episode there. But before you go, I'm wondering if you can do me a favor. I'm interviewing uh, Sheridan Adams and Courtney Monsma next week, who are playing. Oh wow! Uh, okay. Yeah, Elphaba and, and Glinda in Wicked. Exactly. It's, um, yeah, so amazing. And I'm sure you've sent out a message, or or if you haven't, I'd I'd love for you to say a quick hello, so I can be like, oh yeah, who says hi. Yeah, please tell Sheridan and Courtney, I send my very best. I am really, I'm, I'm in the midst of a uh, workshop for a new show, as I mentioned to you here in New York, and it was why I couldn't get down there for the op- the reopening of Wicked in Australia. But I love going to Australia, and I love having an excuse to mm. get there. So I, I'm determined to get down there to see them in person during the run. And, and of course, my best to them and, and the entire company of, of Wicked down there. Definitely. And I'm sure we could go an entire tangent about the upcoming film, which I'm also that we were talking about the other day, which is a whole nother podcast episode entirely. We'll, we'll do another podcast about that. <laughs> so maybe I'll see you next time we talk about that one. <laughs> Fantastic. Okay. Well, Stephen, thank you so much for your time today. This has been um, surreal to to put it. Thank you. No, it was really fun for me. You ask fun questions, and in the end, it wasn't too intimidating. (laughs) Excellent. All right. Well, thank you so much, and enjoy the rest of your day, and um, good luck with the workshop. Thank you very much. A massive thank you to Stephen Schwartz for joining us as our guest on this week's episode. Thank you to Carly Lincoln from Nixco for helping to organise this episode. The Prince of Egypt, the musical, filmed live on London's West End, is now available to stream on digital. Head to theprinceofegyptmusical.com for more information. This episode was produced by Echidna Audio. Follow them on Instagram at Echidna Audio for all their audio services. Once again, if you enjoyed our podcast, leave us a review wherever you get your podcasts and head to the link in this episode's description for our Instagram account, TikTok, YouTube and Patreon. My name's Justin Clark and I'll see you next time here on the Theatre Thoughts Podcast. Hi, y'all. This is Kristen Chenoweth. Hi, I'm Gloria Stefan. This is Sarah Bareilles. Hi, I'm Patty Lapone. This is Lynn Manuel Miranda. You're listening to the Broadway Podcast Network. Love classic literature but hate to read? A Bridge Too Far, the new comedy podcast series, has you covered. All the books that you had to plow through in high school brought to you in just 1,337 seconds. The Great the Gatsby, Wars, Lady Chatterley's Adaptations, and many more. So if you want to look smart in front of your friends and family but don't have the hours it takes to read a classic novel, this is the podcast for you. Abridged Too Far, available on the Broadway Podcast Network or wherever you listen to your podcasts.